Right, is it recording? Oh yeah, we are recording. Okay. Hey guys. Um, so last week on Monday, we had a Blockchain 101 session. So session two. Um, and we had a guest speaker coming, Christoph Gezo from Nethermind. Um, and they're quite a big company in the blockchain space. But unfortunately, the audio messed up again. Uh, so apologies for that. We are trying to, we will try and fix it for next time. Um, which is actually this Monday, uh, depending on when you watch it, um, 31st of October. Um, and yeah, so I am just going to record the session, except with my own slides that I've made. Um, he did have his own set of slides, but um, yeah, I'll just I'll just try, have a stab at it and try and do as well as he did. Um, and so this session is just going to cover Ethereum, smart contracts, and just talking about the whole underlying architecture of Ethereum, which is also has which has also been dubbed as the world computer. Um, and yeah, let's just uh, get into it. Actually, before we get into it, um, I think I'll just cover some of the things we mentioned last week. Um, and so last week we by last week I mean session one. Um, and so session, in session one, we basically introduced you to the concept of a blockchain as a data structure um, with various properties and features such as being append only. So meaning that it's immutable, you can't change or rewrite the history of the blockchain. Um, uh, and then we also introduced like a spectrum of features where like some blockchains lie on a spectrum of different features such as permissionless versus permissioned. So permissionless would be a a a network a blockchain in which anyone can participate in um with no permission and then permission is basically you need you need permission uh, so examples of that would be like um enterprise solutions that are closed off that like companies like jp morgan ibm and ey have made for like specific clients and companies um and they have their own pros, pros and cons um but most of the attention in the blockchain space is on what you call permissionless blockchains in which anyone can um, set up software to become a node operator or participant in the network. Um, and so you have blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Avalanche, Phantom, Solana, Near, and so on and so on. Um, and then we also talked about scalability. Um, well, we didn't talk about it much. We, I just mentioned that there's the concept of scalability when it comes to blockchain. So how, and, and, and I also mentioned that we'll define this in session three, which is next week. Um, and for those who are watching this today, and I'm recording this on the 29th, it will be on the 31st of October, Huxley 213, Claw Lecture Theatre at 6.15. Um, so yeah, uh, be sure to come to that. Um, and then yeah, I also I also talked about how like some obstacles that the space faces, and I'll also touch on that today. Um, and then some I gave some examples of some uh, decentralized applications you can build on top of blockchains um, and I drew a few parallels to the current uh, landscape in tech so like I compared a web3 music platform to Spotify I compared a distributed cloud uh, a cloud storage platform on in web3 to Amazon web services and then I also touched on tokenization of um, investment funds so such as KKR they recently tokenized one of their um, private private equity funds which allowed for more people to invest where like because the, like the way it works in private equity is if you you only have access to these funds if you have a large amount of money but putting it on the blockchain and tokenizing it made it easier for non people like me and you to access it um, and so yeah I just talked about like the general landscape as well which is what this slide's about so you have layer ones which is like the underlying architecture you have layer twos which are focused on scaling the underlying architecture which is so, so it's built on top of the layer one um, and then you have decentralized applications built on top of both the layer two and layer one um, and they use smart contracts and I know it says next session there but we are talking about it this session I just took this slide from last week um, and then I also mentioned an, an interoperability layer so like uh, some some protocols that allow you to send messages, money, or information between different layers, between different layer ones and layer twos. Um, and so, an analogy to that would be, you have like different cities and you have roads that lead into the different cities. So they're they're a bit like the motorway. Um, or in like a more a less abstract sense, I guess you could when you post on Instagram, you can easily or you could yeah you can easily post on. Like Facebook as well, um, and so like there's like a there's like an 
interoperability there. Um, and then I also mentioned oracles, stuff like on-chain, off-chain communication, but like, yeah, won't go too deep into that today. Um, and then, yeah, this is also from last session, we talked about like the whole decentralized application landscape. And so you have things like decentralized finance, which I'll talk about next session, so Monday. Uh, we have identity, which is like um, domains or like uh, identity verification and stuff like that. And then you have music, uh, social data storage, and then you have a lot of other interesting verticals like decentralized science, energy and carbon credit, so regenerative finance. Um, healthcare, privacy, and that should say CBDCs, or central bank digital currencies. Um, um, and so, yeah, I mentioned in this slide that a lot of decentralized applications like these ones are built on top of the layer one and layer two. Uh, but you're probably asking, asking like, how does that even happen? Um, and they, th these sort of applications are allowed to exist through a concept called smart contracts. And this is something that, that a guy called Nick Sable in the 1970s um, basically def like defined, just invented, if you if you like. Um, and he basically defined a smart contract as a computerized transaction protocol that exists, that executes the terms of a contract. The general objectives of a smart contract design are to satisfy a co common contractual conditions such as payment terms, liens, confidentiality and even enforcement minimize exceptions, both malicious and accidental, and minimize the need for trusted intermediaries. So, oh sorry, sure, it's, it's just basically like uh, coded contracts. So like you code, you code agreements with people. And so if a certain event occurred, then some code will execute and it'll spit out some output um, and like human intervention is minimal or sometimes zero. And so Ethereum was the first ever blockchain to allow for smart contracts to, build, to be built on top of it. Um, and so it was, and th that's one of the reasons why it's dubbed the world computer, because you can compute things on the blockchain. Like on Bitcoin, which was the first ever big blockchain, um, you could, the, the, the functionality of, the, of what you could do on the blockchain is very limited, or you could, mostly what you could do is just, basically send money to someone, um, albeit even though like it's cheap and permissionless and fast and you can send it to anyone, that's all you could do, you could send money and that was it. Um, whereas on Ethereum, the use of smart contracts unlocked a whole new uh, world. Um, uh, don't worry too much about the diagram on there, that was just for like illustrative purposes, but like, yeah, I, for the more like, the, the more crypto native people who are watching, you probably understand what's happening. Like Ethereum has a blockchain, but it also has a state. Um, and then you just like Bitcoin and any other blockchain, you have a group of nodes, people um, having their own copy of the database and they verify it through some consensus mechanism, which we also talked about last session. Um, and so e Ethereum can generally be broken down into three parts. You have the Ethereum blockchain, you have the Ethereum virtual machine and you have the Ethereum network and we'll go into all of these three. I'll start off with the Ethereum blockchain given that we've already been introduced to the concept of a blockchain. Um, um, and so yeah, just like last session we mentioned that a blockchain is just a, a, it's, it's just like a data structure in which you have slots of data, i.e. blocks, which are linked through uh, crypt cryptography. Crypt linked through cryptography um, and specifically hash functions. And so like last session we mentioned, you, ha you have a data slot, so a block, and then you hash it, and then you have a next, and after some time interval, you have another block. And then what happens is you link the current block to the previous block via the hash of the previous block. And so you can see, um, I try and lay out what's stored in a block and right at the top is a previous block hash function. Um, and the reason why it can be linked like this is because of like the properties I mentioned of hash functions uh, last session, in which if you change the smallest thing in your input, then you, you spit out a completely different output. And so if you were to go back, and so on the slide, you see the first block there. If you were to change any like single digit or letter in the contents of the block, and normally the contents of the block would be transactions, um, then you would completely change the hash function of that block. And so you would completely change the hash function stored in the next block. 
And because that changes too, you change the hash function on the next block and the next block and, the, and, and so on. Um, and so hash functions unlock a very cool feature for blockchains to be linked like that. Um, for blocks in a blockchain to be linked like that. Um, and then apart from previous block hash, hashes, we also have other information stored, like I mentioned. So you have the transaction root hash, the state root hash, the receipts root hash, the difficulty, the gas use and gas limit, and some more stuff. Um, and the Ethereum Ethereum blocks def, uh, have Ethereum blocks. Yeah, they they have a lot more information than uh, Bitcoin blocks, and that's purely because of the increase in functionality of the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and I'll go into a bit. I'll go into a bit more about like uh, what root hashes are. I think in the next slide. Yeah, in the next slide. Um, and so a transaction root hash is basically a it's the it's the how do I explain this? Okay, let me let me introduce Merkle trees first. So Merkle trees are like a a sort of data structure in which you have a root, and then you have nodes coming out of it, and then right at the bottom of the data structure you have leaf nodes, and leaf nodes are basically the input. So you have TX one, TX two, TX three, TX four. So like four transactions, and then what you can do is you can hash transaction one and transaction two together. To, ke to create like a parent, a parent, um, I don't know what the terminology is, but let's just call it a parent block. Um, and then you have transaction three, transaction four, and you hash that together. And then if you hash tra the hash of transaction one and transaction two, and then and, and combine it with the hash of transaction three and transaction four, you basically get another hash, and you basically treat that as the transaction root hash. And it, it, it long, like, long story short, it just make, basically makes storing information much less computationally expensive because all you have to do is store the hash and not all the transactions that have happened. Um, and then at the same time, like if you were to try and change a transaction, like at the bottom, you would have a completely different hash output. Um, and then like the more up you go, the, the, hash, the hash functions keep changing because the input has changed. Um, and so... Yeah, transaction. But you just need to know that that root hashes basically make things uh, easier to store. Um, so yeah, and then you also have this uh, data structure in um, like when you're storing receipts, well state account storage. And don't worry if you don't know about anything about that. Like it's fine. Um, and yeah, so we've covered the Ethereum blockchain, and now I'll cover the Ethereum state. Um, the Ethereum state is basically just a key value pair of every account on the Ethereum network reduced to a single hash. Um, and so it's basically all the transactions that have happened. And then, um, sorry, no, Ethereum is basically all the transactions that have happened and the state of accounts. And how this is different to Bitcoin is that in Bitcoin, you have the UTXO model uh, where you have like a, you start off with some blob of money and then that blob of money gets split into different blobs and then like the history of the all the blobs are stored whereas in ethereum um and if i'm not making sense just search up utxl models it's, i think it's fairly simple to understand but um but in contrast in ethereum you have a concept that isn't doesn't exist in bitcoin unless accounts so you have you have account based modeling in t instead of utxl modeling so you just store how much the balance of every account basically um, and like I, you've seen this diagram already. So you have you have the state, which is like uh, the hash function of all the all the accounts and their and their information. Those are the key value pair. Um, and then you also have a block. And so every time a block is added, it basically changes the state of the Ethereum network because normally you'd have transactions in that block, which basically change the account balances of a certain wallet. And so that would change the state. Um, but yeah, I, I mentioned transactions, but I haven't actually defined what transactions are. Oh, what transactions are. Um, so a transaction normally contains a few few pieces of information. Do you have the nonce? Um, it's quite unfortunate that Vitalik wasn't from the United Kingdom because I don't think I, I think he would have chosen a different term for that. Uh, but the nonce is basically just a counter um, for how many transactions you've done, like a, a certain what it has done. 
Um, and so your first ever transaction will probably have a nonce of one and then uh, and then like it will increment by one every time you make a transaction and it's just a way of uh keeping track of how many transactions someone has done and so someone can't repeat a certain transaction um and this is also known as a double spending problem and you can look that up if you want um and then you have gas price gas limit and i'll also go into that in a few more slides but but like it's just basically the the fee you pay to transact um, and then you have the recipient, so who are you sending this transaction to? And then you have the value. So like if this is of monetary value, this will be some sort of number. I mean, it's always a number, like it's either zero or some number. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, and then you have data, and this is normally like, this is normally like, uh, like data that would like allow for something else to be called. And I'll go into this uh, in a few seconds. And then you have VRS, which is like a signature scheme. I'm not going to go into that. Um, and so transactions on the Ethereum network can only be initiated by externally owned accounts. And what this means is a, a, a wallet. It can only be, it can, a transaction can always only be initiated by a, a person or some person pressing a button. Um, and yeah, uh, and I should probably also mention that on Ethereum, you have two types of accounts. Um, you have an externally owned account, which is a wallet, a person, someone set that up. And then you have contract accounts where code sits. So like code is stored in these accounts. Um, and so, yeah, I mentioned transactions can only be initiated by externally owned accounts. So meet people like me and you who manually have like some wallet. Um, and contract accounts can't initiate a transaction, but they can be called by an externally owned account to fire it, what you call internal transactions. And in Ethereum, this is more commonly known as traces, but you don't need to know that. Um, and what's interesting is you can uh, extend it on account, can, can submit a transaction and it could call a contract account. And that contract account will submit an internal transaction, which will also call another contract account, which will also call another contract account and so on. And so you can create like a chain of calling different like uh, pieces of code. Um, and so yeah, I, I mentioned that you, like a, a term for internal transactions is traces. Another another word for it is calls. So it's like internal transactions. Um, okay, yeah. So we've covered the Ethereum blockchain and the Ethereum state. So I think I'll go into the Ethereum network. Um, and last last session we mentioned how consensus plays a big part in how people um, sort of participate in a network. Um, and a network is just basically any communication channel in which information is being exchanged. And I also mentioned last session, there are two features that are very important when it comes to creating a functioning communication network, and it's safety and liveness. Safety is the idea that um, if someone sent out malicious information, how do you deal with that? And then you have liveness, and it's like, if, if there was new information being propagated to a network, uh, what is the responsiveness of the network to that new information? Um, and so consensus mechanisms play a big part in that. Um, and Ethereum famously, uh, in August, switched from proof of work to proof of stake. Um, and we covered proof of work briefly last session. Um, we didn't really cover proof of stake much. And so I will go into that in the next few slides. But basically what happened in August is um, the consensus of Ethereum changed, and it's been an event that's been leading up since the very beginning of Ethereum in 2015, when Vitalik uh, promised that the proof of stake transition will happen someday, um, and it did. Um, and so it was, it was, it's basically considered probably the biggest, pro yeah, probably the biggest event in Ethereum's history. And I'll go into a bit more as to why later. Um, and yeah, and so. I'll touch on the life of a transaction. And we also we also covered this last week in the context of Bitcoin, and it's basically the same thing in Ethereum. Um, so before before the consensus change in August, uh, Ethereum was under proof of work. And the transaction life cycle went something like this. Person A was an Ethereum to person B. Transactions, that, that's, that transaction will get sent to all the nodes for that information that person A has sent Ethereum to person B. And they will validate those transactions. And if you don't understand how they validate, you probably want to watch session one because I go into this. Um, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave it as they they validate 
the transaction um, by this session. Um, and after that's happened, transactions get sent into a mempool, sort of queue. A miner places and orders transactions into a block. Um, and miners are just node operators who've been selected to to mine. Um, and I, I went into this last session, so I won't go into it too much this session. Um, and so, yeah, miners spend energy by just iteratively um, going through this, just iteratively putting in different inputs into a hash function until they get a certain number of leading zeros. And once, once they get that certain number of leading zeros, they their block gets added to the blockchain. Um, and then that that action is propagated to the rest of the network. So the, so the rest of the network also add that block to their blockchain. Um, and then in exchange for their, their efforts, a miner receives Ethereum as a reward. But now on the proof of stake, you don't have that energy spending. So what, what happens is you, person A sends transaction, sends Ethereum to transaction B. Again, all the nodes validate, send it into a queue. But then what you have instead of a miner is what you call a block proposer. So a block proposer is selected, and I'll get into this next slide. The block proposer will place an order transaction to a block the same way a miner does, except they're not they're not send they're not spending energy in doing so. Um, and then validators will attest to the validity of the block. Um, and how they do that is out of the scope of this uh, whole series. So if you want to get if you want to understand more about this, then by all means search up. Um, Propose a builder separation in Ethereum, so PBS Ethereum. Um, but yeah, once validators attest the validity of the block, um, the block gets added to the blockchain, and in return, the block proposal receives a reward. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, ma the main job of a block proposal is to order transactions to a block, just like a, a miner, except no energy is being spent. Um, and block proposals are randomly selected. So it's like everyone basically takes turns to get rewarded. Like so, by being a participant in the Ethereum network, you're basically agreeing that one, like everyone gets to take turns in getting rewarded to propose a block. Um, and the block proposals are also incentivized to include transactions which pay the highest tips. And I'll get into what tips are in a few slides. Um, and you're pro you're probably asking, okay, under proof of work. Um, the network was secured by the cost of electricity because it dis disincentivized miners to act dishonestly. Because if they did, then they would basically lose out on the money they've spent in, yeah, all the money they spent trying to get this hash output. Uh, but under proof of stake, you don't have that. So how do you secure the network? Um, and so what you have is you have validators, and so you have va you have the concept of validators. And a validator is any any participant, any node in the net, in the Ethereum network, apart from light clients. And I'll I'll probably yeah I'll go into that this this session. Um, but what validators do is they lock Ethereum and they have to lock 32 ETH. That's the minimum. And then um, there are two subsets of validators. So you have block proposers and block validators. Um, and a given validator can be both throughout their lifetime of being participating in the network. Um, like I mentioned last slide, like block proposers are randomly selected from a, a group of validators. Um, and yeah, so if people, if validators are malicious in any way, what happens is their stake gets slashed. So basically they lose their, sa their stake. And so if someone proposes a block that, that contains like dishonest or malicious information, um, then they lose their 32 ETH. And then the same goes for block validators and attesters. If then if attesters are looking at a block and they purposefully like say like, oh, this is valid even though it's not, even though it doesn't follow the rules, then they also lose their stake. Um, and there's actually been like a very long debate in the blockchain um, in the blockchain space about whether proof of stake or proof of work is better. Um, and I'll just try and point out some of the pros and cons, but again, this is sort of, it's slightly opinionated, so maybe take it with a pinch of salt. Um, so yeah, so proof of work is a tried and tested method, like Bitcoin's been around since 2008, and it's never had any significant hacks or exploits. Um, it's also very easy to implement. Um, 
yeah, I d- don't know what else there is to say about that. Um, however, there is also the sunk cost of buying hardware, like ASICs and mining rigs and uh, whatnot, um, because you have to use those to spend electricity. Um, and you could argue, yeah, you could resell them and stuff, but like, there's also like, you have a secondary market of mining rigs and then like the value changes. And so you don't know whether like you're going to lose out if, if you don't want to mine anymore or not because of the depreciation of your, of your hardware. Um, and there's also the argument that proof of work can lead to centralization more easily. Um, and this is because if you have a mining rig and it's very good and, and, and it's a massive mining rig, the chances that your the chances of success of you producing a hash output that will, that will allow you to add a block to the blockchain and in return receive a reward increases. And as you get more reward, your if if you choose to keep if you choose to, if you choose to hold that Bitcoin and then I don't know reinvest into more mining rigs, then you just basically become more and more powerful. And the probability of you um, getting more rewards become skewed in your favor. Um, and so, yeah, proof of work leads to centralization more. I, I, I want to emphasize it leads to centralization more easily. Um, so like uh, proof of stake can can also lead to se- uh, centralization. Um, and then again, like proof of work uses a lot of energy. Um, and I'll show a chart, I think, in a few slides to show to illustrate that. Um, OK, yeah, so proof of stake I, I mentioned, there's less centralization uh, because the economies of scale do not apply. Um, like as you become bigger, you can bulk by mining rigs under proof of work and your costs become cheaper, basically. Um, and there's also under proof of stake, there's less issuance. So like on, on Ethereum, the issuance of new Ethereum to incentivize participants dramatically decreased. Um, I think it was, it was by like 90 something percent, actually. I'm not sure. I don't have the number on me. Um, but yeah, there's a less issuance of new Ethereum. So from a tokenomics perspective, um, you basically have uh, disinflation, so lower inflation, or in some cases even deflation, which I would, I think I'll get into. Um, and so you have this whole narrative of Ethereum being ultrasound money uh, because it's it doesn't it's not highly inflationary and it's not uh, and then sometimes it can be deflationary. Um, but another con of proof of stake is because it's not a tried and tested method. There's so many variations of proof of stake which have their own pros and cons, so it can be quite hard to navigate around that. Um, and so yeah, you, you have delegated proof of stake. You have like Cardano's own version. Um, yeah, you have a lot of variations of proof of stake. Oh yeah, so this was the graph I was talking about in which I. I basically illustrate the difference in energy consumption in Bitcoin, Ethereum proof of work, and Ethereum proof of stake. Um, and yeah, the graph says it all really. You can see like proof of stake is energy usage is so minute. Um, and actually, like the change in August, the this consensus change right here. Um, on that day, global energy consumption dropped by zero point three percent directly because of Ethereum. So like, I think that's a massive feat um in in any for for anyone really like the fact that you a single action or a single change in code can like uh you know influence global energy consumption by 0.3 percent it's crazy and so yeah just another thing to i guess celebrate and so yeah i mentioned gas gas fees and gas limit and gas price in a few slides um and yeah, so gas is just basically the fee you pay to participate in the net. Not, not the fee you pay to participate in the, the fee you pay to send transactions in the network. Um, and you like this is this is like this should not be new to you. Like you're paying, you always pay fees for everything in life. So like when you when you use Visa or Mastercard when you use your card, you are constantly you you are constantly paying transaction fees. I don't have the number on me, but like um, yeah. But the reason you don't notice it is because it's always it's always like um passed on to someone else and it will normally be reflected into the price of the good you're paying for so like so like the fees you pay for buying stuff are normally reflected in inflation 
Um, and so in the, in, the, in the blockchain context, gas fees are basically the fee you pay for transactions. Um, so you have the, the concept of uh, gas limit, so the maximum amount you're willing to spend, and then the gas price, which is like the the current price of one unit of gas, which is also known as GUI. Um, and yeah, um, every time you some internal transaction happens, you're basically using some some gas. Um, and sometimes what happens is you send a transaction, and it will use gas, and it will call another con contract, and it will use a, use gas again, and then before you can finish the transaction, you you become you get you're out of gas. And what will happen is the the transaction gets refer reverted, and so like nothing happens except you lose the the amount of gas you paid. So the fees you paid will basically be sent to the miner, and so you don't get your fees back. Um, you get how much you you wanted to spend spend back. So like say if I was sending you sending you like five Ethereum and then I also spent 0 0.01 Ethereum in gas because I was out of gas, I lose the 0 0.01 ETH. I don't lose the five ETH. The five ETH comes back to me. Um, and so now I've introduced the concept of fees. You could probably imagine that when the network gets very busy, um, you get a spike in fees because it's all supply and demand, right? Um, because everyone's fighting for their transaction to be included in the next block. So you're fighting for block space. Um, and so as demand increases um, in a short short period of time, what happens is you have massive spikes in fees and this becomes very like undesirable for people who want to use the network and you know use all these applications on Ethereum. And so, um, yeah, it's undesirable. It's not a good user experience and no one would want to transact on any network or any application in which the, f the fees are so unpredictable. And so the Ethereum community proposed a, what you call an EIP, so it's a improvement proposal, and they called it 1559. I think it's called 1559 because it's the, it, that's the, that's the 1559th proposal they made. Um, and it was to make fees more predictable. Um, not only to make fees more predictable, but also something else, which I'll get into. But, bef but before this proposal was um, proposed, you had the concept of gas being the gas limit times the gas price. But now, or after the proposal, should I say, um, you had a, a concept of base fee and priority fee. Um, and the base fee was calculated. So before, the, the gas limit was set by you, the user. Right, and the gas price was was calculated based on supply and demand. And so now you have a gas limit, which is also set by the user, but you have a base fee, which is again calculated by supply and demand using a different methodology, which I'll go into. And you also have a priority fee, which is again set by the user. And so. I mentioned like the base fee has this, has a new methodology of being calculated. So before it was just purely supply and demand, but now it's um, it looks at the previous block's capacity. And so if a block was 50% full, the base fee for the next uh, block would be unchanged. If the block was 100% full, the base fee would increase by 12.5%. If the base if the block if the previous block was not full at all, which never happens, but if it wasn't at all, um, the base fee would increase by 12 point, would decrease by 12.5%. And so basically what you're doing is you smoothen out the, you smoothen out the change in transaction fees um, after every block. Um, um, and so, yeah. And, and like I, I didn't mention two other scenarios where if the if the block is between fifty and one hundred percent pool or like between zero and fifty percent pool, um, and you can read up about that if you want. Um, but yeah, it's it's quite simple to understand. Like you have you you have a gas limit set by the user, which is the maximum amount they're willing to spend in fees, and then you have a base fee, which is set by the protocol by calculating um, supply and demand in a much smoother way. Um, and then you have priority fee, which is also set by the user. And so like a priority fee is basically tips. And I mentioned tips before. Where did I mention it? Uh, 
I must have mentioned it somewhere. But yeah, anyways. Uh, yeah, prior to fees are just tips you pay to the miner, and the miners incentivize to include transactions in their block with the highest tip or priority fee, because they because the priority fee directly goes to the block proposal builder, uh, which is what this uh, graph illustrates. So before you had fees, which would directly go to the block proposal builder, and then you also have the block reward, which is the reward for building the block, putting transactions in. But now you have the fee split into two things, the base fee and the priority fee. So the priority fee, which I just mentioned, is a tip for the for the miner, the builder, the proposer, whatever you want to call them. Um, it will go directly to the miner or the builder or the proposer. Um, but then the base fee will get burnt. Um, and I don't think I've introduced the concept of burning yet, but like in in like uh, cryptocurrencies, you can burn cryptocurrency, which basically means you're you're putting out, you're basically removing them from the supply. And it's it's you could sort of say it's similar to quantitative tightening, in which like central banks uh, reduce their balance sheet and take away, basically take money away from the economy and pretend like it's never it's not there anymore. Um, I say pretend it's not. Yeah, it's not there anymore. Um, and so it's the same, it's the same case with like burning Ethereum. Like you just remove it from the supply. Um, and this is where the whole narrative I mentioned before of deflation, deflationary Ethereum came about, like ultrasound money. Um, because if you start burning Ethereum, and then the demand of Ethereum went up, then you see like a spike in price. But this is all speculative, so I won't go into that. Um, and so yes, yeah, so I talked about fees. Um, yeah, so you have I've, this whole time I've talked about Ethereum um, as a layer one. And so uh, what's recently happened is like a lot of, not recently, but like a lot of, of the community have realized that Ethereum isn't the most scalable. Um, and again, I will talk about this in session three, but it is secure and it is decentralized. And so what if, and so they thought, what if we could build another layer that's built on top of Ethereum that relies on the security of Ethereum, but is but it batches transactions together and so it makes it faster. Um, and so that's what happened. You had you had the concept of layer twos, um, and so you have Optimism, Arbitrum, Starknet, who are coming in spring, uh, Loopring, ZK Sync, um, and you have many more. Um, and their focus is basically on scaling Ethereum. Um, and yeah, you have decentralized, I mentioned before, you also have decentralized applications built on top of both the layer two and layer one. Well, then you also have the concept of uh, Ethereum virtual machine compatible layer ones. So you have Phantom, Near, Avalanche as examples. And what it means to be EVM compatible will make sense in a few more slides, but I'll just for now mention that they basically speak the same language. Ethereum speaks speaks the same language as Phantom, Near, and Avalanche. Um, it's a bit like speaking Spanish and Portuguese. Like it's basically the same. Hmm. I think I missed. I forgot to include a slide here. Okay, I'll just I'll just say it with words then. Okay, so like the Ethereum virtual machine, yeah, because it's not clear that, what the Ethereum virtual machine is, but like the Ethereum virtual machine is basically like a computer. It's a it's a virtual computer, and it follows a set of rules that allow for high level programming languages languages to be converted into low level uh, bytecode, and it's the same way any computer works. To be honest, like you code something in Python or like in some other language, C and it's, it's compiled and it basically gets turned into zeros and ones that the computer can understand. And it's the same thing with EVM, like you code something in Solidity or Viper or yeah, some smart contract language and the EVM will, will basically funnel the, the, the letters of code or the lines of code into zeros and ones or bytecode that the, that the virtual machine can understand. Um, it's a bit annoying that I don't have the slides in here, but like the there's a lot of pros of having a virtual machine, and it's mostly go to composability. Um, like with a virtual machine, you can just download the software and run things. Whereas 
on a, on a, on, a, on your computer on your hardware, it's very hard to have like processes, and processes are in charge of funneling down this high level code to low level code. It's very hard to have processes that are like that understand another processor. So for example, your applications that are built on your iPhone um, are not the same as the applications that are built on Android from a code from a code perspective. Like you have to code it in a different way so that the Android processor understands understands what's happening. Um, and so yeah, a virtual machine and that's for composability. And, and that's the reason why you could have so many you can build a, a DAP, so a decentralized application on Ethereum, and then also move it to Avalanche using the same code because it understands the code. Um, but yeah. I will Okay. Yeah, it's it's just annoying that I didn't have the slides in here. I don't know why it's going there. Um Yeah, so just if you want to learn more, just search up the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, or if you want to, basically, if you want to understand anything Ethereum, just search up how does Ethereum work anyway. Um, and there's a very good article. Um, yeah, I could link it in the bio of the YouTube video. And so, yeah, I think I'll touch on a few like applications on Ethereum. And so, like I mentioned before, like DeFi is a massive space, and I'll go into this again in session three. Um, and like, the whole appeal of DeFi in general is that it's permissionless, it's fast, it's cheap for people who live in developed countries. So if you like, if you live in Venezuela and you want to transact um, on something, like it can become very expensive to go through your bank. Um, it also gives the world access to the dollar, which is a very like underrated feature. Um, like, especially now, given that like all currencies are debasing and weakening against the dollar. And so like the demand to have access to the dollar has never been higher. And so in countries like, like, again, Venezuela, or like, I don't know why I'm saying Venezuela, like any, any country um, that's sort of not as well off as the US, um, it, it can be quite, sometimes it can be quite hard to access the dollar. And so like using DeFi, it becomes so simple. Like it's just, it's just about clicking a button, setting up, set, setting up a wallet and then clicking a button. Um, and so a lot of people have been able to increase their purchasing power. And then you have like things like remittance fees, waiting times, uh, fraud disputes, blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah, so like DeFi is attractive for like various reasons. Uh, well, so you have NFTs. I, to be honest, I don't know much about NFTs. So I'm not going to go into that. Um, you have scaling solutions, you have infrastructure. You have like all these data analytics platforms, one of which I currently work for, but I'm not gonna not gonna mention which. Um, and then, yeah, this this again this this like graphic is nowhere near the full list. Like this is probably around like five percent of the Ethereum ecosystem, probably less. Um, but yeah. And so you're probably honest. You're probably asking like, okay, you talked about Ethereum and uh, all this like underlying architecture of how it works but like what does the future look like what does it mean to even be to have ethereum adopted as the world computer um and so the first thing i say is to have a scalable layer one and again i know it's a bit annoying because i haven't defined what scalability is but like i will talk about it next session um but like generally speaking you want a protocol that facilitates for global adoption and currently ethereum quite frankly speaking, does not. If everyone started using Ethereum today, it would be unusable because of the spike in gas fees and the waiting times and possibly even congestion. Um, and yeah, and so another one is the flourishing DAP ecosystem. So you, like the HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol, for example, um, like no, no, one, no one cares about that HTTP, right? Like the, the average user of the internet doesn't care. They care about that, that like the applications they can use that have been built under the built, built on top of the HTTP protocol so like all these web pages you see nowadays and so like a flourishing application ecosystem is needed for like global adoption because no one's just gonna no one's gonna inter like the ideal world is in which you interact with the ethereum network without knowing you're even interacting with the ethereum network um yeah uh, one example recently actually is reddit they they started doing digital avatars, which are in the form of NFTs, and they they got like three million different users buying digital avatars. Um, and the genius was that they didn't even mention NFTs at all. 
to like the people who they mentioned like the features and properties of an NFT, but they didn't mention that it was an NFT. Um, and so like that's just one example in which like if you want if you want blockchain to be adopted, then you want to make make it such that people don't even know they're using blockchain. Um, third point: advancement layer two. Again, this goes back to the scalability thing. Um, and the fourth one, solving the data availability problem. And I just put that out there for people who want to go and look into this more. But yeah, this is way out of the scope of this series. And then, yeah, last I should have mentioned obstacles. So like, I, I, thought, I thought I'd just reiterate it again. So you had trust, so people actually trusting the technology. Um, and this is more, again, this ties into the second one, the regu regulation side. So like you want, like for people to trust the use of blockchain, you need like regulation around it. and the thing right now about regulation is there's so many great areas and a lot of like because the the technology is growing so fast and it's so nascent the the boundaries by which regulators regulate by are always changing and so again great areas they don't really fully understand what's going on and so it's going to take a lot of time to mature like the technology to mature to allow for regulation to mature um and the third one i already talked about this user experience user interface Fourth one is security and auditing. And so like in the blockchain space, you have a lot of like exploits and bugs and smart contract hacks. Um, and I get this is prevalent in like all tech, but like um, if you want a decentralized permissionless network in which people can trust, then you need to make sure that security and auditing is like number one priority. Uh, and the last one is governance. And I won't go into this, uh, went into this last session, but like generally speaking, if you own a token, you have a stake in the network and you can vote on things, but like the mechanisms by which you vote and the rulings for vote weightings is sort of ambiguous right now in the blockchain space. And so there's a lot of work being done on trying to navigate that whole thing. Uh, I'm not gonna do this in the recording, but like in the session that Christoph came in to speak, he did a live transaction to show you what it actually is like to transact on the Ethereum network. Uh, and thank you for listening. Next session, we're going to talk about the blockchain trilemma, layer twos, and decentralized finance. Um, and yeah, for those who are interested in like data analytics, um, and even if you want, I would highly suggest you give it a go. Um, we are doing a blockchain analytics series in which we teach the language of SQL while also teaching uh, general blockchain concepts. And this goes beyond the concepts spoken about in this in this series. Um, and so, yeah, you can become a data wizard and work your magic to untangle messy blockchain data. Um, so, yeah, it's going to start on the 7th of November. It's every Monday. I will be doing the first session. And then every session after that, I think, is external speakers. And they are industry experts. Like They're, they're the very best. Um, and the whole thing is sponsored by a company called June Analytics, which is like the number one data analytics platform in blockchain. Um, and... Yeah, because of them, we get to have pizza for every session, every in-person session at least. Um, and yeah, this is also something like you can talk about in your job applications and stuff. This is quite a unique thing to talk about, but it will, it will give you an edge and make you stand out. Um, and like, even if you're not interested in blockchain, I would say like you would still probably benefit from this series, given that I'm teaching you, or I say I, we are teaching you the like basics of like SQL, basics of SQL, and then also intermediate SQL. Probably not advanced, but like if after this series you, you know, build on top of what you've learned, you could get there very easily. Um, and then yeah, we've actually already had this event, the Women in Blockchain panel. Uh, funnily enough, we only had two women in the room, and the rest were men, which is, which is a bit weird. But um, yeah, a bit a bit of a shame really that only two women came up. But like if if anyone watching is a woman or has any uh. Uh, female friends then like feel free to actually please no, no, not feel free please please get them to come to our events because we're trying to promote the diversity um of the blockchain space um and yeah we have other we have other sessions like the rust workshops that are happening um starting from the 8th of november every tuesday at uh, this time and then we have a massive algorithmic training series in spring which i can't talk too much about but i can try and hype it up a bit and say that it is it is going to be really good um and yeah just sign that if you scan that qr code it will send you to our link tree and you'll find all our links um and yeah thank you for listening if you're still here um actually if you're still here comment what's your what's your comment 
Uh, uh, comment W A G M I. That stands for we are all going to make it. No, we all going to make it. Yeah. W A G M I. It's a very like uh, famous phrase in blockchain space. I just want to see how many people are still watching this. If you're still watching, I don't know why I'm still here. I'm just rambling on. All right. <laughs> I'll stop this.